Welcome to In the Open with Luke and Joe. I'm your host, Luke Schantz, and here's my co-host, Joe Seppi. And a big welcome to our guest, Space Tech CTO, Naeem. Before we get to our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for joining us today. We have an exciting show for you. We're going to be talking about space tech and edge computing. But before we bring in our guest, Naeem, let's bring in our co-host, Joe Seppi. Hey, Joe. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Uh, welcome back. Glad to have you back on In the Open. Yeah, it's great to be here. Second show. Rocking and rolling. Um, so, oh, go ahead. The weather is great here. And I know you know that, too, because you're in Connecticut as well. But it's like it's 58 degrees. It's fantastic. It is. It's uh, I, I feel like winter may give us another little taste, I think. But I, I am feeling that the hope springs eternal. This is very it's a beautiful <laughs> time of the year. I think For there's sure. even been some space weather lately. I saw something in the news about like a space hurricane. We're going to have to ask name about that. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, yeah, this is going to be a, a, such an interesting show because, you know, edge computing is a big topic that I'm interested in. And it seems to me like edge computing in space is the ultimate edge, right? So the edge of our known world. Yeah. And, and, and um, you know, one of the things that kind of, I don't know if, if pride is the right word, but having joined IBM a few years ago, like the work that we've done uh, with in, with NASA and stuff with the, 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 the moon launch uh, landing and everything. It's all just really, you know, I, I love the space tech stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk to Naeem. Well, before we bring him in, he gave me a short video that we could play. That's going to sort of set up one of our first topics we're going to be talking about. So let's, let's get to that video. And uh, without further ado. Perfect. From the earliest days of Apollo, when NASA landed the first humans on the moon, IBM has had the distinct honor of playing a key role in NASA's space exploration efforts. Fast forward 50 years to today, when the International Space Station is helping to lay the groundwork for living and working in space, a baseline for future NASA missions. Traveling at over 17,000 miles per hour and orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes, the ISS offers a one-of-a-kind microgravity environment where crew members perform research that cannot be done anywhere else. Critical research like DNA sequencing on the ISS provides foundational knowledge that will be essential as NASA seeks to venture further into space than ever before. However, analyzing this research often requires data to be downlinked to Earth and processed by personnel on the ground, a procedure that can take several weeks and delay results. That's where IBM comes in, in partnership with NASA, ISS National Lab, HPE, and Red Hat. IBM created the Edge Computing in Space solution, eliminating the need to move massive libraries of DNA sequencing data by presenting containerized analytical code locally right on the ISS where the data originates. This solution has the potential to cut analysis time by nearly 50%, opening the door for many new mission possibilities. In addition, NASA researchers will use this platform to more rapidly develop, test, and push code to the ISS in a fraction of the time by leveraging Red Hat code-ready containers and connecting to IBM Cloud running OpenShift on the ground. This groundbreaking partnership will not only expedite NASA's ISS research, but will help to lay the foundation for future exploration opportunities on ISS and beyond. We can't wait to support what comes next. Hello, welcome to In the Open Name. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So before we dig into uh, so many exciting topics today, let's just help our audience out with a, a little brief self-introduction so they get to know uh, who you are and where you're coming from. Sure. So yes, my name is Naeem Altaf. I'm IBM's Distinguished Engineer and uh, CTO for Space Tech. Uh, I run an innovation lab, which is based here in Austin, Texas. Excellent. So let's dig into the video first. So this is crazy, right? So now we've got... Yes. And it, so, and maybe we should lay a little foundation here too for our audience. If 
maybe we need to let people know what edge is and why, mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously uh, the thing that comes to mind here is bandwidth issues, right? You can't have all the data in space and bring it back down. So I think this is actually, if people weren't familiar with edge, this is maybe one of the best use cases to help you understand why, why edge, right? Sure. Yeah, so uh, let's start from the terrestrial on the ground stuff, right? So there's a huge buzz in the industry about the, the 5G, 5G networks, right? So basically what edge at a very high level, what edge means is that, you know, edge but, or what edge computing means, wherever the data is being produced, you do computation right there. So let's say if you have a sensor far, far away in the ocean, which is looking for temperature and stuff, right? You don't want to bring all that data onto the where are, wherever you're on prem or on the cloud and do processing, you want to do processing right there. So that's what basically edge computing means. Another good example is the smart cars in you know, a smart home of the future and the autonomous cars. So imagine if the car in you know, autonomous cars of the future, there every time they have to make a decision, they're asking the cloud or coming back to on-prem data center and saying, what should I do now? Can you imagine what, what can go wrong there, right? It has to make a decision in milliseconds right there. So that's like a moving edge computing platform right there, where it's making decisions, learning from its surrounding, from all the sensors and making a decision right there. So essentially it's really like decentralizing where the computational stuff is happening and, and which is really important with all the uh, IOT devices that are, that are proliferating around the world. Exactly. Uh, big thanks to because the compute is very dense now. The microcontrollers we have, right? From Raspberry Pi, Arduinos, Jetsons, Nano Jetsons, right from the NVIDIA. They are so powerful, they even have GPUs on them. So you can do inferencing, you can even do modeling. So wherever you in the remote areas, you can do that. And in our case, we wanted to extend that to space. Because like you mentioned, Luke, the, uh, the latency issue, the bandwidth issue, if, if we have challenges on the ground, there are much bigger challenges when we are in the orbit, uh, around five, 600 kilometers above. So there's a lot of stuff which happens there. We can, we will talk about that. And the idea was, can we do computation right there and get the actionable insight and send that piece of info nugget down to the ground? That makes so much sense. So walk us through a, a little bit more detail than what was in the video about uh, sure. what's being done now and, and maybe how it's going to be used in the future. Yes. So last year, uh, we, uh, we I got together with the International Space Station, National Labs, NASA, and uh, HPE. And uh, we were looking for the projects where we can you know, extend the concept of edge computing in space. And they mentioned this uh, project, DNA sequencing, which runs on the uh, in, in the space station. As you know, space station, in simple words, is a big laboratory, which is orbiting the Earth. There's so many experiments happen for microgravity, for the future exploration, right? As we had heading towards, you know, in the next few years towards moon and planning towards Mars, right? So this is like a lab in the orbit, so you can do this different tests. So one of these uh, use cases of uh, DNA sequencing was where they take a sample from the surface or they're looking for microbes in the environment and they can do a DNA sequencing right there in the orbit. So I think three years ago, they sent this min iron device up there, which is a hand, sort of a handheld device which can plug into as a USB device into a computer. And the way it worked today was, or last year, that uh, the PI, which is the principal investigator on the ground, they will put a request in and they say, we want to take, you know, we want astronauts to take a sample. And based on the, whatever the schedule of astronauts, they'll take a sample, and it can create up to like a half a terabyte of data. So it's one run. And then all of that data needs to come down. And then it needs to be processed and all the logistics and everything. A significant time has passed since I put that request in and when I get my results back. And what I'm looking for is basically a, a resulting file, like a PDF file, which tells me you know, the resulting data. So we said, okay, you know what? Uh, we can do all this processing right there. Because uh, on February 20th this year, the SVC2 computers from HP, they were going up with space -born computers. And we were in partnership with them. So you know what, we have the compute right there, which has GPU and CPUs. So all we need to do is you know, take this open source code. And it has like multiple steps. It's very complex. Like it has the base scaling. It has the demultiplexing alignment analysis. So we broke it down into, OK, for the base scaling, we need a much more powerful processing, which is GPU. So we used GPU for that. 
And then when the results comes out, we will take a second system because there are two systems for the CPU computation. So we took the open source code, uh, we containerized it, and then we used our you know, OpenShift a code ready container platform. So we, we packaged that whole thing. Of course, there's a lot of testing, security scans you have to go through on the ground because we had an exact replica of those two systems on the ground at NASA's facility. So we can test it before you can push it up. So we did all the testing, the, the stuff, the code was put on, I think around October on the flight system. And now they're up there. So we are hoping by end of this month or first week of April, yeah, we will be able to bring systems live up and start running through the, the process. And this will, and, and, and just to, to close, this will, uh, the whole process will take around six to eight hours. So let's say if PI put a request in and next week it's scheduled for the astronauts to take a sample, literally after that will take probably a day or two and we will have the results. And that's as compared to what before? You, you, you probably like six to eight weeks, easy. Wow, wow yes. that's oh, wow. huge. Yes. That is huge. And just a, a, a note for all our listeners, we are monitoring the chats across the platforms. We have our uh, associate producer, Cozy, out there uh, monitoring. So if you have any questions about space tech, edge computing, or and anything we're discussing today, please feel free to drop those in the chat and we will get to you. So something Joe and I were talking about, uh, name when we were prepping for this was this is also exciting and i must say i am i have serious jealousy when i hear you talk about like oh yeah i was working with um you know the space station and they asked me if i could do this and i feel you know i like i like what i do but that is definitely cooler than i think what i do so let me ask you this is there any way that you know the average developer or student could get involved and somehow be doing something with space computing definitely so let, let's say, for, for example, in, if you go onto the NASA website, they put out these different projects all the time for the community to get involved. I mean, they're also big in open source. IBM is big, huge in open source. So we open source two projects last year, which was recognized as a top five open source projects for the game changing of future. One was about the space situational awareness, and one was about the CubeSat frameworks for the autonomous uh, you know, CubeSats or drones. So it's open to public. Anybody should be able to hit, like you know, the URL you just shared, should be able to hit them and you know, let's contribute, work together. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I I'm I'm super excited about this sort of work. I, I um I get these alerts when the ISS is flying over my sky and and you know can can go out there and take my son out and you know that's they're they're out there in space flying over so that's yeah. really cool and it's great that that folks can get involved with that work I'm I'm really excited definitely and, and if you you know if folks get a chance right uh you know we'll talk later about a little bit about Starlink right it's it's like a train of sixty sets it's like a reindeer passing by right you cannot miss it so. Go on the sites. There are many sites which tells you, you know, when these satellites will do a pass over your location, and you can see these things. It's really cool to see that here. Yeah, and that, that's a good segue too. I mean, there's lots of stuff, you know, stuff orbiting uh, the Earth. And I was reading a little bit about the the link is down there too. The Space Tech uh, SSA. Um, yes. Talk to me about that because I, I, it's amazing how much stuff is out there, from small to really large and you know traveling at great speeds and uh it seems like it it'd be kind of a little bit of chaos yes so it, by the way the speed in the lower earth orbit which is uh around uh between 100 to 1000 miles that's classified as the, as a lower earth orbit they're traveling at 17 17500 miles per hour these objects it is extremely fast right and even if you have a small debris 10 centimeter, no, one centimeter, it can do a substantial damage if it collides with an object. So this is a very, very hot topic in the space industry. And you will see the names like space situational awareness, space debris, right, space traffic management. Basically, we are trying to have a grip on what's out there in the orbit. Now think about, you have seen these uh, sites like uh, flight radar and stuff like that, where you are, you are tracking your flights going from A point A to point B. Imagine if your control tower is saying that a flight coming from Austin to Connecticut and it shows you four paths, right? Now you, I mean, it can be a disaster, right? At, on, on the runway, you, you don't know which one to trust, which is the right path. And you have thousands of flights every day. 
So, so this is a problem where we need to track what exactly is there and what is the path of these different objects. And you know, the, the way to do it's done is through the radars and it's done through different uh, department of defense and there are some private companies doing that. So, so going back to your point, you know, what's out there, what's this, right? So to date, before Starlink came two years ago when they started launching their, these uh, satellites, we had launched 9,000 satellites, which we public knows of, right? And uh, out of those, 5,000 are active. The rest is debris and stuff like that, right? Now, in just today, today there was another launch from SpaceX to put these Starlink satellites this morning. And their count, I think, has gone to like 1,200 plus now. They plan to put 14,000 satellites in the next two, three years. Then, there's, then there is uh, Amazon Kuiper. They want, want to put 3,200 there. Then there is one web. They want to put another 2,000. And then there is a unknown company. It's, it's still being talked about from China. They want to put 13,000 more. So you're talking about around 30 to 40,000 sets in the next three to five years. Whereas to date, you only had like five to nine, between five to 10,000. So can you imagine what's going to happen in, in that congested space? Because of commercial reason why they want to put broadband, all this stuff. So that's why we, uh, the conjunction search. So we want to know when the objects are coming closer to each other. Just last year, space station had to maneuver three times. Maneuvering in the orbit is, is like the last resort. You don't want to burn your fuel. It's, it's very, very limited and expensive. And the one of the, uh, you know, the uh, part from a previous rocket, it was coming within few kilometers range. And actually the astronauts had to go into the evacuation mode, I think into the Suez uh, capsule to exit in case it was that serious. So yeah, so this matter is very, I think this is where the open source community, the developers can really take it to the next level. And I would even go as far as say, uh, this is an optimization problem. This is where quantum, this is, this is these are the magnitude of problems where quantum can help, right? Even though it's, we are in early stages of uh, quantum computing, but start thinking about it. What can be done and how can we use this next generation of compute to solve these problems? Because, and, and another thing is, it's causing also lots of challenges for these uh, astronomers on the ground. You, you have seen these billion dollar telescopes in, in South America and Chile and Europe, right? Which are doing these deep space uh, observations. Now, imagine if you have this web of stuff in their path, you're obstructing with the data light coming back in. So, so we have to, th I mean, we have to think about it, right? Like how can we optimize all these things and, we, and everybody's happy. So I think this is a huge area. Yeah, and that that doesn't seem like you know our our, our producer Scott is uh, blasting messages at us that I think is 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 apt like massive air traffic controller problem like this isn't this sort of stuff isn't managed by humans right I mean I would have to think that this is like AI ML sort of work and you even mentioned quantum like how how do you manage uh, especially with the proliferation of of stuff in the future. What, what, how do you how do you really uh, uh, manage all that? So the first thing is, like I mentioned, right? The uh, it's hard to know what's in the orbit just you know from, from for the commercial companies. Even though there are a few which is which are emerging, mostly this this domain is owned by the DoD and the forces, right? Because they have these radars and all this stuff. So what we what needs to happen first of all, this is a policy thing where the governments needs to come together and say this is a serious threat. To the, to the humanity and all that stuff, we have to come together and work, just like climate change kind of stuff, right? We need to work together, we need to have policies. And then we have to, technology is there, technology is not a problem. We can use, for example, we can use blockchain. So if let's say all the agencies, they start sharing data. We can use blockchain, so we can have the transparency, provenance, trust built from there, so everybody knows who is touching what in, in the data sphere. And then we can have AI ML to figure it out to detect these orbits and predict better movement of these objects. And, and like, you know, this year, I think this year, yeah, ESA is sending out a spacecraft to cl clean up, to remove the debris. And that's a classic uh, traveling salesperson problem. Again, looking at supercomputing, potentially quantum in future, right? It can be done, but the governments have to come together. Otherwise, which what I fear is, like any other thing would happen, that they probably wait for something happen and then say, oh, now we have to get together. So I hope we, before something bad happens, we come together and pay attention. This is a serious problem. 
Yeah, it, it's the classic kind of thing. Like you know, code is easy. People are hard. Um, you know, it's it's not just the the code. It's the the the, the government entities and policy and getting everybody to, uh, on on board and working together. I imagine that's probably not easy. Um, and then I don't know if this is a question from uh, the chat or, or from our uh, producer here, but uh, it's a good question. Are there multiple orbit layers, like high Earth versus low Earth, uh, varying yes. opportunities and challenges uh, within that? So there are three layers on the top. One is a low Earth orbit, one is a middle Earth orbit, and one is a geo, geo geosynchronous orbit. So in the low Earth orbit, that ranges between... 100 to 1,000 miles. And that's where most of your Earth observing satellites, space station is above 254 miles above. These are all things are in the low. Majority of the stuff is in lower Earth orbit. And uh, and that's why, and since it's moving so fast, uh, that's why you, you can see them orbiting almost like 12 to 13 times a day, these satellites. And for Earth observation, these modern satellites which will go up, they can scan the whole globe right now in two days, in future in one day. So your data is only old 24 hours. So imagine that, and then the resolution is 50 centimeter. They can literally watch what's in your pocket kind of stuff. Right? The second is the MEO, the middle Earth orbit. That's where your GPS satellites are there and military stuff is there. And then you have the, the geo, which is the above 22,000 miles above. This is where if you have the dish at home, like dish network or dish, right? Because it's synchronous with the Earth's rotation. So it's it's not like lower power. It's going zoom zoom zoom, right? So you will you know you will lose connection every ten minutes because the pass is only eight to ten minutes. In geo, you are in sync. You're dishes, right? So you always have a constant connection. So these are three orbits. Yes. Fascinating. So let me ask you about the other project we're linking below here, the uh, CubeSat project. Where? Where does that fit into the orbits and where does that fit into the, the hierarchy of, of CubeSats? I'm imagining you've got these, you know, space telescopes and communication satellites at the top. And then we've got this whole continuum down now to the CubeSat. Yes. So the, the idea behind that open source CubeSat project was basically a distributed computing. And if you have a swarm of these CubeSats. So what's happening in the industry, and I think the from our uh, developer point of view in the cloud native world, they can probably relate to this. Before the cloud native containers cube, we had these monolithic products, right? Takes long time to develop and have a you know very less frequent releases and all that stuff. It's big, big thing. Think of that those big satellites which we build for like two to three hundred million dollars. Takes like three to five years, you know, huge cost, and you send it up and they stay there for 10, 15 years and that's it, end of life. With the concept of CubeSat is very similar to microservices. So you have these very small, lightweight, you know, cheap. I mean, a, a, a pro cube with you know sensors and everything is half million compared to two to three hundred million. Students build these CubeSats for less than fifty thousand dollars. So let's say if, even if we take a pro stuff, half a million dollar, right? You can build these things with, within six months. Within one year, you can launch them. So if you have these uh, swarm of these CubeSats and because the technology is so advanced, the cameras we have and the and the compute power, you have like, you know, a Raspberry Pi with eight gig memory with a, you know, quad core processors and everything. And with this and with GPUs as well with other microprocessors. It's very powerful. So what's happening in the industry, the trend we are watching that companies are going with these small set category, like CubeSats, even nanosets. So, so what we thought, okay, if we have a swarm of these, let's say, 13 of these, we launch them. And there is a hurricane which is coming, you know, in, in, in the in the Atlantic. So I, I send it basically it is fully automated, fully autonomous. So a signal goes from the bottom or the machine learning model detects that there is something being formed in the ocean. It asks all of its peers. Basically, it's based on messaging system, open source nets.io. It asks, okay, who has the bandwidth in terms of resources to go and look at this problem? And out of those 13, maybe seven will say, we are available. It forms a virtual cluster. And it says, let's start working towards this problem. And then you can get the payload from the from the ground and say, you know, here's a new model. Start doing inferencing on this kind of a problem. So basically, distributed computing at the edge, you're forming clusters to tackle a problem. The same concept can be applied under drones. So we can have cluster of these drones in the ground. Actually, that, that brings me to another point. There's a very interesting thing happening in the industry 
So the next generation of communication between the ground and satellites is the optical. It's a laser communication, much, much faster, high bandwidth. Today we do mostly radio signals. But the challenge over there is clouds. And most of the time the earth is covered with clouds, the areas which are of interest. So how do you handle that stuff? There are companies who are saying, you know what, we can build these drones which can fly above the clouds. So they can be um, like a middleware. So they will intercept the signal from the satellite and they will do processing and then they will fly to where they have a line of sight to the ground station, clear, and then do a downlink. So a lot of innovation is happening, but I think this, this uh, you know, the, the, the light uh, optical connections, it's gonna, teach, it's gonna move even more compute up there because you will have so much fast connections. See, the compute is not a challenge. You saw with Mars rover, you know, we are using the IBM's, uh, you know, chip, power PC chip from, from 10, 15 years ago, right? 10, 50. The, the network bandwidth and speed is the challenge. If we solve that problem, it will be really cool. That is amazing to think about. It's like, it really is like some kind of science fiction scenario you just laid out about like beaming data to, you know, drones that are relaying it. Uh, yes. it, rem it reminds me, like I saw in Eastern Europe where they didn't have a lot of infrastructure. This is like 20 years ago. They were building open source line of sight IR network devices. They mm -hmm. would just use like a piece of PVC and literally like the IR, uh, you know, generator from like a remote control with a lens and they could create these one kilometer like 10 megabit connections but again like you're saying once the once it gets foggy or it's raining the network's down yes Amazing. yeah people talk about clouds you know moving everything to the cloud but now the clouds are in the way oh. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> yes, yes. Or, or we go you know we move the cloud up into the orbit right so yeah yeah when you were talking about drones i was like is it going to blow the cloud away <laughs> <laughs> that that can be interesting too right have much bigger drone with the fans and say just move aside get yeah aside. yeah at least enough to like you know uh, get, get get the optical connection that's that's fascinating but that also brings uh again these are these are new problems right so it's very challenging i mean interesting stuff so optimization path for the communication from the orbit to the ground station. Again, opportunity for machine learning, AI, potential quantum in the future, right? If you have, because you cannot have ground stations like the like the towers, like the cell towers. It will, Earth will not look pretty if we had 50, 70,000 ground stations everywhere, right? So if you have only limited one, how do you route efficiently? How do you route it down and how do you route between them? This is an optimization problem. Yeah, fascinating. And, and like you said, this the salesman, the traveling salesman thing. You know, yes. uh, uh, I imagine you know we we talk about quantum being you know emerging over the coming years, and I wonder how much more that will will come into play with these scenarios that you're describing. Yes, it's really interesting. So, Naeem, you were on the my podcast last year, and when we were talking yes. then you had mentioned there were all of these Mars missions coming up within the next like six months. And now I think all of them have played out. So could you give us just a quick little industry snapshot of what's, what's happening with Mars and, and help give us some context around why it's important. Sure. So, yes. Yeah, so last year around summer uh, in uh, I think August, July or August timeframe, these three missions flew the, the the first one was the uh, UAE Mars Hope, and that was an orbiter. The second one was the TN wind from China, that was orbiter plus the rover and the lander. And then the third one was uh, NASA's, uh, you know, Perse per Perseverance, which was the lander and the rover. So the first one, of course, uh, it takes six months to travel. And in February, the first one was the the Hope. Probe. The second one was the the uh, the uh, Chinese probe and rover, and third one was the the U.S. Uh, rover. So the the U.S. probe hope is is orbiting, and its uh, primary goal was to look at the weather patterns on the, on the Mars, and because that will help in the future if you you know want to habitability and you know sending you know people to the Mars in the next decade or two decades, right? So it's going to learn about the atmosphere of the uh, of Mars. The uh, Chinese uh, 
it will do a similar thing. It's looking for ancient life when it when they will deploy their rover in May. And that is the most hardest, as you know, because you know, you saw those seven minutes of terror, as they say, right? When it's coming down. Because the lag is 11 minutes of uh, communication between Mars and Earth. So if I told you something, go and execute this. For the next 11 minutes, I have no idea what you did. And and in within those 11 minutes, in seven minutes, it has already landed, right? So so I, so uh, China will attempt that in in May, and uh, so they was they, they're also orbiting the Mars and looking for the uh, atmosphere, and then they will go to look for ancient life. And the Mars is Mars is uh, the uh, IBM's uh, no, IBM's NASA is also very interesting because they have a helicopter Ingenuity also attached underneath the rover, so they they, they are doing multiple things right so they want to also go and look look for the life any signs of life any uh you know over there then the very interesting thing they are going to collect these samples and then hand over to this uh helicopter and the helicopter will go and then there will be a future rocket come will pick up the samples and bring it back that's to be in future but that's that's what the plan is about so yeah very fascinating i think it made some movements uh yesterday or two days ago and it can hear for sounds also so because we have much more interesting uh the uh you know computers on the top the chip was as you know was the power pc 750 single core if you just want to do a comparison right so that chip is 233 megahertz and the clock speed you have on your iphone is 3.2 gigahertz so it's comparing 6 billion transistors to almost 16 billion transistors the, you, can, you can imagine how much difference is, but the, but the name of the game is reliability, because it has to be radiation hardened. It's it, the environment is very harsh. So, anyways, this is glad to have that chip over there and uh, running. But uh, yep, in in near future we will start seeing some very interesting things coming back. You already see the pictures coming from the from the perseverance, right? So, yep, it's very fascinating. Amazing, and. There's talk of, you know, within decades or decade, even sending people to Mars. Is this does this uh, does this seem realistic to you? I know that's kind of a, a out of the blue question there, but well, the thing is, the the, the the big challenge first is the landing. The landing is the hardest part on the Mars because of its atmosphere. It's, you saw we, this time they used parachute, right, to to land the rover. Now, if if we are talking about Starship, it's a gigantic ship almost like 10 stories tall right the i think in next 10 years if they can successfully multiple times launch and as you know the window is so long it's six month window to get there so i think after 10 years maybe after 10 years because this uh, rover is also going to study because the atmosphere is full of carbon dioxide so you have to convert that co2 into the oxygen so i think 20 30 years yes it's far so interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I, I want to uh, bring in a question from our producer, Scott, and this is something I was thinking about earlier too. Um, uh, Scott asks, are there any concerns about a critical mass of orbiting devices and crafts that somehow impacts like weather systems, global temperatures, uh, reflected sunlight, which is something I had wondered about too, and and, and how can we um, you know help monitor that and, and work through that? You mean for the, for the our, our orbit, correct? Yeah, the orbit, orbit stuff. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it, it's a big concern. Like the so one concern we we heard from the you know from the uh, astronomers and the, the scientists on the ground was that you know the light which is being produced by the Starlink satellites because of so many of things is reflection and causing you know disturbance in the data, right? But the solar weather. So like you guys mentioned, you were mentioning earlier the that hurricane which we just saw this phenomenon. The first time we have witnessed that, right? This, Basically, you, you probably are aware of aurora, right? When the when the solar winds or the solar activity happen from the sun, and the, it, it hits the magnetic field on the north and south pole. When they both combine, this beautiful thing happens in, in the, which we call them the northern winds or you know northern lights. They call them right. Or it's, or aurora is the name. So yeah, it's, it's a huge concern. Actually, it's a very good question you asked. Uh, our next. Uh, open source and research project, which we just kicked off last week, is going to be space weather, because space weather plays a huge role. It in, impacts the communication. So you probably have heard about that. You know, in, in certain regions of the world, 
the uh, cellular communications were not available for this amount of time. This is because your sun becomes so active and it sends these flares. And what we need to do, we need to, uh, and it, we can get like two to three days in advance. NASA has the website where you can get all this data. And based on that, you want to maneuver your satellites. You don't want the satellites to get hit with that directly because it will damage the electronics over there. But it hits directly on the ground as well, where it can damage the grid. So this is a serious stuff. Uh, and we are going to start working on the space weather now. And this is again open to the community who wants to help. But I think this is a very, uh, another interesting use case. And it de indefinitely it has an impact. I remember reading the, the scenario like this. It happened in what, the late 1800s, they call it the, the Carrington event, where there was some sort of solar weather that took down the telegraphy system. So, mm -hmm. and I, maybe we haven't had an event like that, uh, yes. that equivalence, but there is this, you know, right. yes. er, early tech, we actually experienced solar weather affecting telegraphs. Exactly. So, and now we have the technology, we have the probe, we have, there's a, there's, there's a solar probe, right, which is so close, I, I just, it's just mind boggling that in this probe is so close, it's, it's watching the sun now, it's close, right? So we have probes between sun and uh, earth, we have, I think, at least two or three layers of these probes, which are watching these, uh, these activities from the, from the solar activities, and that can help us to predict the events happening on the, on the earth and how do we can maneuver. And again, like I said, in the next three, five years, if, if the, you know, the skies are going to cover with all these 50,000 sats, the first thing is the sats are going to get affected. So everybody needs to be smarter how to use these resources because the space is for everyone. It's not for one person, it's for all of us, right? So we have to be very smart how we use these resources. What you had mentioned to the regulation around this is, it, it rem I guess my question here is like, this seems like a scenario where it's almost like, the age of the ocean from a bygone era where you have like the law of the sea and it, like you're saying, it's based on precedence. And so it seems like there, you know, obviously we've been in space for a while, less than a hundred years, but, but a lot of this is like, you're saying it's, it's uncharted territory literally and, and figuratively that we've got to sort of work out with these different countries for a, sort of a collective good. For, yes. For example, if you have a, half a billion dollar satellite in low earth orbit and I have my cube set and they are coming in each other's way, who should move? Common sense will tell you who should move, right? But so for, a similar incident happened without naming the two companies last year. One had a big satellite and one had the pizza box. And they said, move because in the next three days, there's a possibility of collision. And, and, and the messaging which is happening is through like, I sent you an email and the pizza box company said, oh, we never saw your email. And of course, the half a billion dollar guys had to move their stuff. They don't want to get destroyed, right? So you can see this. So yeah, there needs to be policies, laws, more kind of a real-time system, messaging system. And we have, we have fixed this problem with the social media, the, the amount of traffic which flows every day, right? What, this, is, this is a very small problem compared to that. So I think it can be done. It's just a matter of people coming together. So when you say pizza box company, <laughs> I'm just imagining, you know, this, thank you for ordering, you know, box flying through the sky. What, what? Uh, is yeah, that I mean, it's just like, it's just to say that the, the very small. Okay. Uh, okay. That's all. But, 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 but the, the, there was a company, I think last year or the year before, they said they want to advertise from the orbit. So they want to have a big display. I mean, come on. Let's not go that far because there's so much great work happening on the ground for deep space observation. We don't want now ads showing up at the middle of night from the from the lower Earth orbit. But there's lots of crazy ideas happening right now. I think people are thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded when I lived in Boise a long time ago, there was a local pizza place that actually delivered a pizza to Alaska, and it was a big story. But I, I it did. Uh, I'm curious though, like. Um, it, as there's more like kind of consumer sort of stuff, like how do you manage that? And maybe that's off topic, but it, it, it seems like the proliferation would just be astronomical, uh, uh, pun intended. I mean, the, regulatory, the regulatory authorities, they are the only ones. Otherwise it's a wild, wild west, right? Just go and claim and, and, and the next thing is moon, right? Okay, who, who, whoever goes there first, put their flag, it's there, the whole moon is there, right? So there has to be agencies coming together and the regulatory authorities and have a plan for it. I mean, 
we are not opposing the technology. It's it's great for everyone, but let's have a plan. Let's not not pollute it. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to explain to my son last week, like he was talking about selling property on the moon, and I'm like, you can't you can't just sell it, you know. Anyway, uh, just reminded of that. That's interesting. He was going to be a. He's already. He's enterprising. Yeah. He wants to be a real estate agent on the moon. <laughs> yeah. um, so, well, on, 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 just just we add one more thing on, on that note, right? The uh, the asteroid mining, right? I think that has a that that's a trillion or I I, I don't know what's the high higher than trillion. I know it was a very some interesting word which has like many zeros. I can't count. That's the industry to go in because you go and get that rock from that flying you know asteroid and we already see saw attempts last year the japanese agency and the nasa they both took a sample and brought back that's another huge area of exploration you can combine that with nfts and you know forget what it. <laughs> <laughs> i'm going to short asteroid mining we'll see how it goes <laughs> Where are we? Where, I feel I'm. I'm remind, were we talking about some sort of astro mining thing a long time ago, Luke? What was? Yeah, we were at an event, I think, on Roosevelt Island at yeah, that like exactly. tech campus, and I had just read about it, and I came to you, and I'm like, Joe, this is a trillion dollar idea. We're gonna <laughs> yeah. we're gonna do space mining, and I'm gonna set it up for IBM. Trillion yeah. dollar idea, and I think people were like looking at me, like they were like, what is he talking about? Or should I? <laughs> Should I be listening to this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still into it. I want in. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. W one question uh, that that came to mind about the idea of edge on, um, you know, on satellites we're talking about now too. But I'm a, I could envision now that we're going to be going more to the moon and Mars. Are we going to see a, a data center on on Mars where, like, let's say IBM puts a data center on Mars, and then now we have like cloud compute for the you know different teams that need it and these sorts of things can we extend that model is that is that what's going to happen so yeah but before we go to mars let's go to moon first right so okay. so in the next four years yes we are you know at the artemis program uh, going back to the moon uh so the uh, nokia they got a, a contract to put 4g network there and a nasa team they want to put a lunar data center there are already discussions about lunar gateway so yes, it is happening. So putting data set, because this time their mission is to go and stay, right? And to set up a base there for future launches from there, especially if they can find water over there, right? And they can use that as a fuel and stuff to go to the next one. That will be huge. So yes, data centers are coming on the moon. If this, if this, if this uh, Artemis program, everything goes smoothly, we will see, uh, some flavor of Kubernetes and containers running uh, on the lunar data center. That is so cool. Yeah. But that won't be, for example, it will be etched from else, but it's, everything is relative, right? From there, it will be, they'll call it on-prem, right? So <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point you bring up too, because I feel like the term, I think that's why edge is such a confusing term sometimes because you know, one person's edge is, yeah, is, is another person's, you know, regional, uh, you know, CDN or something. It's it's all relative to where your work's being done. Yeah, it's, the, the spectrum is huge, right? So let's say all the way from traditional ways of where on-prem you had data centers, then the evolution in the cloud came into picture. And then you have these, let's say if you talk about telcos, right? They have MTS or the switching offices, so, right? You can just, wherever you stop, you can say, this is my edge, right? You stop there. If you go one more further, you say now that cell site, which also has, uh, if you have looked at the cell site, they have like a room next to it. It has computers, everything. You can say, that's my edge. Or you can say this Raspberry Pi in my hand, which is talking to the cellular network all the way back to the cloud. This is my edge. Or somebody can say, my sensor is my edge. So spectrum is huge for edge computing, yes. That's really interesting. Um, I, I, I want to ask you like kind of what you're excited about in, in the future, but I feel like a lot of what we've been talking about is what you're excited about and, and, and coming up. Uh, but, but another project I think we've, we've talked about, I don't know if we want to get too much into it here, but the, the Mayflower project, you're, are you involved in that as well, right? Yeah, so me and my colleague Eric and uh, Brett and Don were actually from the Mayflower. We actually worked together three years ago on a, on a, on a napkin. To put this thing together, how are we going to build this whole thing? So, yes, so we were involved from the very first day, and you have seen like you know 
last year it went into the waters and most of it's happening to me what mayflower is uh, in very simple words it's a it's a lab it's a lab in the ocean and it for folks if you can go mass400.com you will see the live dashboard everything that's what we our team folks our team they built so i want to give a shout out to ben sigley and my team he did all the development of that most of the back end stuff so what we see this uh, boat is a lab so think about this uh, i was actually just talking to brett two days ago i was like okay you know what your your lab is floating in some you know far far areas in the ocean because i you know almost one fourth of the world is oceans plenty of water there and there is no connectivity right what if we have our satellite and i want to say you know what uh, because of gps i know where you are can you go and check for certain things around you because you have so many sensors there and i send you a payload i send you a containerized code relay through the satellite and dump to your board and then you can do your stuff and send me the results back so that's the next thing which we are thinking about to connect space to the ocean and to the board with the satellite and how we can do communication and now that is an edge right that's an edge in the ocean somewhere and we have an edge in the space so we are trying to bring all these things together now yeah that's fascinating really cool stuff that reminds me too uh, uh maybe two years ago joe and i were doing an event in new york at a maker space uh called fat cat fab lab and one of our advocates um, at the time bought one of those Iridium satellite rock block development boards. Mm -hmm. And it was this, like he did the demo, sent it out through like the cloud. And then like, everyone's like looking out the window. And then like, it, took, it was like a lot of anticipation of like, is this, is this gonna work? Is it gonna come down? And, and it did, we ended up, we, we sent the message through the cloud and we got it back through the thing. And it was like a huge hit. So, uh, but I'm imagine you know the bandwidth there was limited and the coverage was was somewhat limited. But now we're seeing this like you're you're mentioning there's going to be a over this next few years a proliferation of global bandwidth connectivity with like you said at least three or four different companies or governments putting up these huge communication networks. Yes, and for anybody out there who's listening, right? If you're interested just to start playing with this stuff, you need a parabolic dish which is like 100, 120 bucks and then a Raspberry Pi and a SDR, software defined radio. Hmm. Just plug that in. And you, if you have seen the images from the GOES 16 and 17 satellites, the full globe picture with the weather pattern, everything with the, uh, with the you know, clouds, colorful pictures, you can get that every 15 minutes. I have in my backyard. And you know, once you point, because it's in a geo, so you point to it, that's it. So every 50 minutes, you will get the latest picture, which no one, everybody is getting, you will get in your lap. It's, it's that easy, right? And, and you will learn a lot how the communications are happening between the satellite, because you, are built, you have built a ground station now. So you have a ground station at the back home, and you plug it into your laptop, and you're getting these images. And, and if anybody does, just Google it, Go 16 open source SDR. You will get the whole stuff written there. Just follow the instructions, you will have it. Yeah, that's really cool. That's, uh, you know, I've mentioned before, I have a, a young son. I'd love to put that together and, and you know, just really kind of explore the connection between us and what's out there in space and whatnot. It's really cool. I, and I was going to ask, too, I'm glad you jumped in with that, but are there are there other ways to kind of, um, you know, get, get general regular people kind of involved in some of this work um, in that sort of tangible way, you know? Yes, so, so there's a community called SatNox, uh, and basically these are amateurs all over the country and uh, all over the world, and you can get the code run on Raspberry Pi, and they're basically getting signals. You just need a software-defined radio dongle. It's a USB device, and you can start getting signals from, you know, they are the, actually the first ones, whenever you launch a, launch the uh, CubeSats or small sets, they basically broadcast a message to all these amateurs, you know, who can find first signal, right? And it's very cool. So if you want to learn about that, yes, be part of that community. Very cool. We should do that. I feel like that would be a great project. We could even, uh, I'm sure that like you said there's tutorials out there, but maybe we could even yes. do like a, a blog post on IBM developer about that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's so interesting. I, I definitely want in. Yeah. Yeah, I had we had a, a dish satellite on our new house here, but we use you know regular uh, DSL or whatever whatever it is, and so I, I actually took the dish off and we're using the arm part to like hang a bird feeder and yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I did the same when I got that parabolic dish. I used the you know old arm of that dish 
and I plug it there and put it in the flow and it's now pointed up here. Great. I'm glad I didn't take the whole thing down. I can just hook up a, a, a better uh, parabolic dish on there too and just get started. It's great. And I also wanted to mention that regarding the CubeSat stuff, I found a blog yes. post that um, your your team put up and that's the link to the blog post that has some stuff about the, the CubeSat project. Cool. And we, it looks like we've got a question from Facebook. Uh, what's the role of Kubernetes in this from, from edge to satellite question mark? Yes. So the, I mean, this was the experimentation, which we did with the, uh, ISS on, you know, for the DNA, the, the DNA sequencing, basically, you know, we, we containerize the code and we use the queue platform so we can run multiple workloads in the future. But it can be, de again, depending upon the footprint of your hardware. Like, let's say if you only have Raspberry Pi, right? You can use Podman to run your container. The goal was to run a containerized code, right? Which is a self-containable, clean. I don't have to be dependent upon, because when you're in the space there, it's air gap environment. You don't have luxury to go and let me go and grab something from the internet, right? You can't do that. It has to be everything enclosed. So that was the reason we, you know, and plus we had, a higher resources to run this DNA sequencing. But for example, if I had to do my cube set, unless I don't have a very, very lightweight footprint of cube, I will probably use Podman. Interesting. And, and you, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's what we've mentioned here in the video, I saw Red Hat uh, uh, as well. Is that uh, OpenShift running on, um, on some of this? Yes. yes. And is it is it the code-ready containers? Uh, Correct. Uh, I'm curious. Um, do those have the code ready containers? Um, are they able to be kind of deployed on these smaller systems? I was kind of under the impression that you needed a, a, a development machine to really run those, but how is that working? Yes. So, yeah, because again, on, on this system, these are like the enterprise class servers. So, it wasn't a problem okay. to run this. But if we are looking at a lightweight, then yes, a little, little bit more power. But there's, I know there's some work being happening, but you'll see some interesting stuff happening in the next few months. Yeah, really cool. Really cool. And, Fascinating. And just this is like a question slash comment. Joe, I know you're you're deep into the JavaScript, but if you do any computing for these satellites, no hot linking any NPM stuff. You gotta <laughs> you got <you> to <laughs> put that in the in the container. It's just not going to yeah. can't have that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can help myself. <laughs> In, in, uh, this is dumb, but in uh, uh, last last year's OpenJS World Conference, we had a, a NASA astronaut uh, uh, as one of the keynote speakers. And of course, my question is, you know, NPM modules are heavier, the heaviest thing in, in, in the world. And like, yeah, I don't know if that's actually true, but um, you know, <laughs> I had to ask. Silly. Cool. I, well, you know, are, are there any other things that you're excited about that you want to share a name before we uh, before we kind of look to wrap up? Yes, few, a couple of more things. So one thing, uh, as a IBM's, uh, we are going to uh, very soon uh, release an official space tech report, our vision, and we reached out to industry leaders from instead of like just going to like a uh, hitting NASA ESA thirty times. We went to like all the different startups on the terrestrial networks and see what they think of space. How are they related to the space? So to get a you know uh, a much broader view of what the industry thinks about space. So we will have our vision, what we think. What I mean, I mean we have a long history, you know, like you mentioned in the, in the beginning, right? So we are no strangers to space. But so we put our vision there based on the current and future technologies, and then we will have a point of view from all these industry leaders. And so the stay tuned, that will be coming soon. And just a teaser, you know, I, I think I mentioned about the uh, CubeSat stuff, right? So that, that's one of the, uh, what I want to, you know, what, you know, IBM to be seen as that we are democratizing access to space for everyone, right? That space, because in, imagine, right, to, to build something and launch, it's a privileged thing. It's only few nations, and within those few nations, only few groups can do that. I think about majority as well, because space is an inspiration. When you talk about space to anyone, regardless of their whatever field they are in, it's very inspiring. It's like it's just like we look in above and like every night, every night I just go up and I just look at the sky. It's like so peaceful and calm and stuff, right? It gives you inspiration, right? So the goal over here is that you know, once everything goes fine, that we open it up to everyone 
in the world that you know what, what the goal here is the kids sitting somewhere in far far part of the world and they write this you know very simple uh, python code and just submit to us and we will push that code all the way to the space and it will do some computation and come back with the results so so they can also feel attached to you know to the space that's yeah that's the goal yeah that's cool if you could put a message up in space that would be even cooler but i know that's probably <laughs> <laughs> but it's true like i i walk the dogs every night and i and i do it i, I live kind of in the woods now and um you know the lights are out and uh i, I just stare up at space and it's just really amazing it's really 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 cool yes. there was some company a while back i saw that was doing some sort of artificial like meteor showers where they would like basically send up some sand and then throw it at the certain certain time and you'd see this thing but i i don't know if that that really that didn't scale i'm, I'm pretty sure um <laughs> the, uh, it's, a, it's a good question though i mean do, do is that a, is that part of the you know air traffic controller work that's being done not just are they colliding but like any sort of uh meteors or meteorites coming uh, into the atmosphere any activity over there, yes, because they have the they have the equipment to to watch for those things. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Uh, measure it and share it. Sharing is key. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And are you finding um, in this work like collaborating with other uh, uh, entities and governments? Uh, it, it, I, I, like I said earlier, people is the hard part. But are people generally working together well and and kind of coming up with policies? collaboratively uh, in a positive way? Yes. So one of the leading uh, professors, his name is Mori Bajar. He's from UT Austin here. And uh, he is like the most uh, vocal you know, in, in the space. And he's very well versed with the knowledge and everything. So we have been collaborating with him since last year. And these open source projects for the space, we were working with him. Actually, we had a call with him yesterday also, where we are going to look how the space weather has an impact on the objects in the orbit. Does it move up? You know, whatever happens to the characteristics of the object. So yes, we are collaborating with the universities very closely. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I, I encourage folks to um, follow Naeem on Twitter and, and the work that, uh, that that he's doing because there's just so much interesting stuff happening now and happening in the future. It's really really cool. Thank you. Yeah, and it seems like if we get this figured out and we do this right, I mean, the potential upside here is like you know we live on this finite Earth with finite resources. And if we can make this transition and like get into space mining, get communication, energy, it's really it could be, you know, the new uh, new new boom up up there. Yep. Very cool. Let's see if there's any other questions coming through. I think we are going to try to wrap at the top of the hour because that's what we're scheduled for. Um, there was some question about. Um, it's not really a question, but it says something about making the environment safe for DNA. I think it's a question about is the DNA, does it get damaged in space? Or I guess imagine if it's inside the space capsule, that's radiation shielded. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. And so, uh, it seems like we have another question here. Can satellite images provide real-time traffic control, maybe for self-driving communications too? Do we have a system... Uh, uh, perhaps good enough to continuously track uh, so many areas and so many uh, vehicles, I guess, maybe is the question. So, I, I mean, of course, GPS is there, right? So, you know, if you use Waze and all these apps, you know about the traffic stuff. And But the, uh, the interesting thing, which we just heard uh, two days ago, that Starlink is going to open up for the mobility, for the trucks, vehicles, uh, ships, right? So I think that the more connectivity you have, the more precision will come in the picture. So yeah, I think in future, and I, and I think this is this is a big disruptor. This, uh, for example, like in, and, and this is again for the people who are listening, right? Think about these use cases. So think about when the natural disaster, anything occurs like that, or uh, the fires or any of these things for the first responders, right? You're in very remote areas. If you have a little bit of light compute and you have this Starlink antenna, right? You just plug it there. Now you're connected to the world. So there are so many use cases because not you can be because internet connectivity is not everywhere. Even though we assume that maybe it's everywhere, but if you go a little bit north of cities, the connection drops drastically, the speed and everything. So that's why the FCC awarded these big contracts to provide the broadband connectivity to all over the U.S. Right, 
And that's where the governments are coming up now and thinking, okay, if I will have a connectivity at two or 300 meg in far, far areas, what can I do? You can do so much environmental monitoring, so many things. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a game changer. Let's keep an eye on that. Yeah, really cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been really a pleasure having you as a guest. And thank you to our audience for uh, spending this time with us chatting. And we definitely, I think, uh, Naeem, let's maybe later on this year at least come back and give us up because there's so much going on in this space. We'd love to have you back on. Thank you so much, Luke and Joe, for having me on. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. Cool. Don't panic. Right. Thank you. Yeah.